Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, a back door built into many common routers gets covered up instead of actually patched. And to exploit it, all it takes is a simple knock on the door. We'll share the details. Then cross VM attacks just got much easier. A great big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 159 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We recorded this episode on April 24th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, Ting, DigitalOcean, and iX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Our live stream, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine. You can find that over at scaleengine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. <laughs> hey, Alan. Good to have you here in studio. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry that uh, you came to the studio at a time when Comcast is having a region-wide outage. So you get to basically come to one of the coolest internet broadcasting studios that has no internet. Yeah. So then it just becomes a, a room. A room with, with sound insulation and yeah, cameras and lights. That yeah. Lot, lots of fancy lights. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we we uh, normally do these shows live, uh, but we weren't able to today because Comcast, we don't know what the problem is. That would be interesting to find out later. Yeah. It, it seems like a really large problem. This is like a yeah. heat map of the outage. Yeah. The whole area. This like, whole area, but also apparently some other areas. Yeah. Really uh, the whole, like the whole I-5 corridor is, is knocked out from Seattle about 40, 50 miles north of that. Uh, so we're doing some of it, like we're tethered right now off of an HTC One. <clears throat> Ting saves the day. Yeah, Ting is saving the day. So we're driving some of our visuals, like the web, the web pages of stories we're talking about and things like that. But we don't normally have our uh, our co-hosts, uh, quote unquote, the chat room with us. Normally we have like that's the third rung of the show. Yeah, we're we're rudderless today. Yeah. But I think we'll do okay. It's actually we've got a pretty interesting uh, lineup of stories. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're going to get into that. But before we do that, I wanted to thank our first sponsor this week, and that is Ting. Go to techsnap.ting.com. That's where I want you to get started. And let me tell you, I'm a happy Ting customer right now. Techsnap.ting.com will take $25 off your first month of service if you bring your own device. If you don't have a device yet, I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but they'll take $25 off that first device. That's a great way to get started. 98% of people would save money with Ting. They have no contracts, no early termination fees. There's no bundling or ride-along services. You just simply pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 per month, and then your usage on top of that. Well, when you're in a situation like we are right now where the Internet's out, and you have three people that need to use the internet to do their job, you don't want to have to worry about constantly bumping up against some sort of artificial data barrier that all of a sudden your carrier decided, well, bits beyond this number are precious, and we're ch- we'll charge you at an exorbitant amount for that. Yeah. All of that just goes out the window with Ting. It's just literally what you use is what you pay, $6 plus taxes, and then just usage on top of that. So we have peace of mind knowing that we're not going to get some sort of crazy bill at the end of the month because we tethered for a little while. Yeah. So techsnap.ting.com is where you want to go and check out their new devices page. They've redone it Mm -hmm. right here at the top. They have the Ting Personal Shopper, which just turned two years old. And this is really great. If you have an idea of the type of device you want, you go in there and give them the parameters. They'll go out and find a used one for you at a great deal. So the value there is incredible. But you can also just grab a SIM micro card for the Nexus 5 or the iPhone 5. They got the Nano SIM for the iPhone 5. Mm They have some feature phones here. Look at this, Alan. 27 bones. You, sp- you spend $27, you have this phone. You own it outright, and then it's just $6 a month. That's The value there is amazing. Yeah. And, of course, they've got, uh, this is something I'm seriously thinking about right now, is this Novotel MiFi, $119 out of the gate. And then after that, it's just a $6 hotspot. And then whenever you need it, you just turn it on. They've also got the uh, Netgear Zing with its own LED screen. And uh, you can now buy the iPhone 5 through Ting. They'll, uh, they use their partners at Glide to hook you up. So if you want to get an iPhone 5, 250 bucks for an iPhone 5 that there's no contract. No yeah. contract. That's incredible. They've also now got uh, the Samsung Galaxy S5 Black. They just added that recently, as well as lots of other great devices. And Ting always has a really great blog, too. I recommend you check it out. They just had a really good... Um, they invited, they invited one of their advocates. Ting has a ground crew program. When you become yep. a Ting customer, you can essentially become an affiliate. And if you get other people, you get rewarded. If you, move, if you move other people over to Ting, it's a really great system if you move over to Ting because you basically become a Ting advocate after you used it for a while because you'll love it so much. Yeah, it's just like 
you would do it for free because you just love yeah. it and you can't help but brag about it to yeah. every time someone complains about AT&T or something. Right, we're geeks. That's what we do, right? That's like we love to advocate the thing that we have found. Uh, and so they have a whole ground crew program for that. And they just recently gave away $10,000 to one of their ground crew members. Wow. They brought him into the office. They're like, yeah, just come on in. We just want to talk to you. Just come on in. Yeah. And then they, they brought him in this big, like, huge check, like the big check. And they're like, uh, here's your $10,000. Yes. <laughs> so they have a video of that up on their blog. It was pretty cool. And, you know, that's just... Gives you a little, you know what? I think it's because they're Canadians. Yep. I think it's, I think that's what it is. It is. So go to techsnap.ting.com to get started. That lets them know you heard about it right here on the TechSnap program. And it lets them know you appreciate them supporting TechSnap. But it also gets you that savings. $25 off your first device. If you're going to bring a device, $25 off your first month of service. And don't forget, Ting has no hold customer service. Just call them 1-855-TING-FTW anytime between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Eastern. And a real Canadian answers the phone. That's a really good service. It so is. a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, Alan. Now, I know we have a lot of places to start, but uh, this first one not only has an awesome graphic of yes. the problem, but it, it's sort of a follow-up to a story we covered weeks ago yeah, about right, this we'll back door. In. Yeah. So what's going on? So uh, researchers originally back uh, around Christmas time found a back door in a bunch of different routers. It was uh, 24 different models of routers. Uh, from Cisco, Linksys, Netgear, and Diamond, and a couple other places. And uh, basically what it was, was they listened on a certain TCP port, and if you sent the right message there, you would get a root shell on the router. Uh, and just take <laughs> yes, it over. I remember. And that's crazy, right? Like, it, you could dump the entire config file and see what the passwords were and everything that was in it, just change the configuration, all that kind of stuff. So this could allow an attacker to get inside your network by, right. you know, your machine's behind it, so it's protected, but he can be like, well, I'll forward this port to that machine, and now I can connect directly to that machine from the internet, and right. it's not behind the router anymore. Uh, or make changes like, I want to do a man-in-the-middle attack on you, so I'm going to change the DNS resolvers in your router, which all your devices get from DHCP, uh, to point to these malicious DNS servers I've set up. So now when you try to go to your bank, you go to my website instead and type your password. Right, or even just like snoop on you. Yeah. Like even if you just wanted to snoop on somebody and monitor their activity, you could use this vulnerability. Well, yeah, you could install TCP dump or something on the router and just make it copy every packet it gets and upload it back to you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, So they patched it, right? Yeah, so uh, shortly thereafter in January, Netgear released updated firmware from their vendor, Sircom. So the company that actually makes the firmware is called Sircom. Uh, and then Cisco and Linksys and Netgear uh, so buy... they even make their own firmware? I guess, that figures, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, rather than every router company making their own firmware, there's a couple of companies. It's just like BIOS is on a computer, right? Yeah. Um, and so they got an update. Uh, the researchers then dissected that newer firmware, and what they found was... All they had done is change the back door so it listens on a Unix domain socket instead of a TCP socket so that generally it's not accessible from the network. But if you're on the device somehow, you can still talk to the back door, which <sighs> seems really strange. Uh, and then what they did, uh, well, the researchers dug around some more and they found that in certain circumstances, the back door will re-enable and accept TCP connections again. <laughs> oh, man. You got to be kidding so me. Specifically, if the router ever receives a specially crafted Ethernet frame, uh, it will re-enable the back door via TCP. It'll fire up the application. So basically, if it gets a certain packet, it will actually run a command, which is the back door with the flag to make it listen on TCP. Uh, and they also found a little bit more about what the back door can do. Uh, you can send a certain kind of magic packet over the LAN or the internet interface, uh, but it's an Ethernet packet, so it's not routable. So you can only ever do it if you're on the same network segment. Okay. So if you're on the LAN or the wireless, you can do it. And if you're the ISP, which is one hop uh, from the internet side of the router, you can do it. But if you're on the internet, you can't send this magic packet. Gotcha. Uh, but one of them enables the back door. One has the router reply to you with its MAC address. Uh, so you could send, a, say, a broadcast of that packet to everybody, and then each router that is vulnerable would send you back its MAC address so you could address each one of those individually. <sighs> you can send a certain packet to make it change its LAN IP address, which <laughs> might suggest what this is actually for, right? Yeah. So ISPs can manually yeah. just reconfigure everything or you know, have a, an automated system for configuring all the routers, which makes sense if it's an ISP-provided router. It doesn't really make sense if it's a Netgear you bought at the store. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that's just because they're using the same firmware. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, there's the conspiracy possibly. angle you could take on this. And then also, uh, there's three different packets that make the different LEDs flash. <laughs> which which makes sense from a debugging perspective. Is your like, light flashing? Well, no, but it's like you can send it a certain signal, and if the lights flash in that pattern or whatever, you know it's doing what you would expect. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this to me, what's, what I find to be interesting about it is that they call, I mean, what, what, where I'm still hung up on here is this was quote unquote a patch, right? So this was yeah. something that uh, they first, they didn't, they didn't even say anything about so it. Yeah, they people had to find it. Well, yeah. So, so there's a back door in these routers and somebody finds it and complains and they're like, oh, sorry, it was an accident that wasn't meant to be left on or right. whatever. Uh, and then in their fix for it, all it does is hide it better <laughs> yeah and make it so it can only be triggered if okay. you know how to make this special so packet. I- is this tripping your conspiracy radar or do you think no this is just lazy people and they just want to they didn't want to take away a, a useful tool yeah but it's my router i there shouldn't be any tools on it i don't know about right you physically buy something you install it in your house yeah. right i mean you own it top to bottom yeah uh so yeah this definitely seems hinky seems yeah. like they, they're they, crossing a line regardless. They left the back door in on purpose. This is definitely intentional. Whereas so. originally you could argue that uh, it was a debugging feature and it wasn't meant to be left on in the production firmware image. Right. And uh, this, you know, the, when their fix is just to make it harder to trigger the exploit, you well, know and, that and they like were doing we it on purpose. Well, and like we talked about the first time we covered the original iteration of this quote unquote bug, uh, you know, what if somebody grabs uh, their web browser session somehow. Maybe they, you know, they, they they can take control of the remote machine through something they install on there or something like that. It just seems like the fact that you have to be on the LAN is definitely a big part of the defense against this well, being no, taken advantage of. Because this one will it, accept the magic packet from the internet. Just oh, because it's an Ethernet frame, oh, you can't oh, oh. send it from more than one hop away. Right, yes. So, so that's so, so your ISP can trigger this vulnerability. Yeah. Right, but, but somebody... Cut, you know, on another further connection. way, can't yes. yeah. But anybody on your wireless can. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So if they yeah. jumped on the wireless, yeah. Yep. I was more thinking just take control of somebody's th- machine. The way way it seems to go seems if you get this magic packet and it enables it, it enables the TCP port, so anybody can exploit it from then on. So once it's on, it's on. Yeah, once it's triggered, like when you restart the router, it would be off again. Oh, again. that's right, but, that's right. But yeah. it seems like, you know probably trivial to turn it back on if you could yeah, turn it on in the first like place. If, if you could only uh, talk to the router via these Ethernet frames, yeah. then that'd be one thing. Yeah. But what you do is you send this one Ethernet magic packet and then it's just a regular TCP port that you can mm-hmm. remote control. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely seems hinky. Very interesting. And uh, and so the, the routers that are affected run the list from Cisco uh, and the, of course all of their Linksys brands, Netgear, yep. And uh, uh, Diamond? Who's Diamond? Yeah, I've never heard. I've of I've never heard of Diamond either, but they're affected too. Yeah. So it's a, it's and, and and when you when you bring in Netgear and Cisco alone, yeah, which includes all of the Linksys products. Yeah, that's just a huge fraction of all the writers out there. Yeah, that's got to be the majority that yeah. that literally all have this bug. Yeah, I mean, well, there's 24 models. <coughs> Not every model has it, but yeah. Okay, but worse is just the fact that they. You know, you apply the firmware fix, you think it's fixed, and it turns out all they did was hide it better. And it's really just a secret knock that you have to be able to figure out how to yeah. send this thing. Exactly. <sighs> that, I mean, it, it sounds made up. It sounds yeah. so implausible. It sounds like we're making it up, but it yeah. is it uh, is literally happening. The researchers have a great PDF there that, that gets into some of the details and oh, shows yeah, yeah, how yeah. to construct the packets and all that stuff. Yes. Uh, was this the one? No. no, that's a different one. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. We had limited PDF options today, so I yeah. only grabbed one PDF. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's six mags, Alan. Uh." Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. so uh, you can check out the the PDF uh, yourself. It's linked in the... uh, Yeah, in in the the show show notes. notes. All right, well, very good. Any other thoughts on that story? Uh, No, that's about it there. All right, well, I will take a second, and uh, I want to talk about uh, one of our favorite companies in the entire world, and that is the great folks over at IX Systems. I want you to go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Would you do it for me right now, please, and let them know you heard about it right here on the TechSnap program. Now, here's why you want to go to IX Systems. These guys are making some of the best systems available to run open source software, and they're powered by those great Intel Xeon processors. They've got a whole range. 
from the free NAS Mini, which you guys know we love, all the way up to the super crazy custom high-end stuff. And the great thing is, is at every stage, it doesn't matter if you're buying the, the consumer product or if you're buying the enterprise product, you're going to get that white glove treatment. You're going to get that burn-in Q&A that iX Systems does. And really, they're the industry benchmark when it comes to this kind of stuff. And you're going to get that entire wealth of expertise that the entire team over at iX Systems yeah. has. I mean, they, like, if you, if you could equate iX Systems staff to, like, a sports team, they like have a whole bunch of all stars on their team. Would, yeah, it would just be like the Hall of Fame. Yeah, people. like really, like and and you know uh, the thing is, is, when you get a group together like that, that are all working on a common goal, some amazing things can be accomplished, and some incredible products can be delivered. And as somebody who's worked in IT for 13, 14, 15, whatever it is, makes me feel old when I say how many years it has been. I have jumped around from all of the major hardware platform vendors, all of them top to bottom. And I have to tell you, out of all of them, iX Systems at the end of the day is the one that stands out for me. Yep. It is absolutely the one I would go to today if I was building a big or small infrastructure. And I'll tell you what, when we set up the new studio here at JB1, the first piece of gear I moved in was our iX Systems free NAS Mini. So that way we could get right to work with centralized storage yep. on something that would be absolutely reliable and also very important, take advantage of that new Cat6 uh, network we have throughout the whole building, yes. right? I want speed. Yes, they were like, I can finally saturate the gigabit. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was talking but, about it before know, the show. I just bought another system from iX yesterday. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, we've been running the quote back and forth, but I, I pulled the trigger at the airport in Vancouver yesterday because that's yeah. when the email came. Well, you know what I think is funny too? It's like if I was going to go like before uh, before I when I before I bought the free NAS, I was talking to Alan and I said to Alan like, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about doing that. And this is long before IX was, this was a couple of years even before yeah. IX was a sponsor. Uh, and I said, you know, what should I do? And Alan said, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you. I would do this, but what you should do is contact IX Systems and run this past them and see what they say because that's who Alan goes to to get his stuff checked out and that's who I'm going to to get get my stuff checked out and you can too and then the best part is when you implement that kick-ass solution you know that ix systems is going to have your back with the support sure. they're not going to get freaked out because you have linux or free bsd or windows or whatever you put on there they're not going to like oh well you'll have to call red hat for that you'll have to you'll have to call free bsd i don't know who you call over there but i'm sure you can look up their number on google you're not going to get that runaround have you gotten that before <laughs> it's the worst <laughs> So this is what you do. Go over to ihexsystems.com slash techsnap. And if you want a little, for, a little more ammo to uh, maybe there's somebody up in the chain above you that has to be convinced, they've got the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. It's 11 key traits you just must absolutely demand from your provider. They got a free download right there at ihexsystems.com slash techsnap. And don't worry, they're not going to spam you. No, this is like why ix is better than Dell or HP and, and why yep. Dell or HP can't do what you need. And you know what's so cool is speaking of community and things like that, uh, Alan and I are about to attend Linux Fest Northwest this weekend. And guess what? IX Systems is going to be there. They got a they got a link right there. And I like they. I don't think the original uh, Linux Fest Northwest logo had the uh, BSD uh, logo so. uh, demon Especially in there, but the, no. The kind of but he's there in there now, oh, and yeah. I'm liking it, Alan. I'm yeah. liking it. So uh, check it out, ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Yeah, and a I, really big thank you to the IX The biggest systems. difference there is that is. They're not trying to sell you some hardware. They're trying to sell you a solution to right. the problem you're having. And and literally, like, that's not just a buzzword. Like, they actually mean that, and they actually right. do it's, that. It's the main reason why when you go to the website, there's not just, here's the four configurations of, of server you can buy. Right. It's fill out this form and tell us exactly what problem you're having. Yeah, and at first you're like, whoa, that's weird. That's not how, no, I just want an online, no, that's yeah. not how I, and then you realize once you start working with them, oh, this is part yeah. of the process to make sure I so get like, the right solution. Here's a list of four fancy SAS controllers. I don't know which one I need. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no kidding. It's like, so you tell them what you want to do and it's like, oh, okay, well, y if you do it this way, then here's this way, say, or, or we can do it this way too and it has this advantage and this disadvantage or whatever. Right. And, yeah. And you know, like, the great thing is, like, you know that recommendation is solid. Yes. That's... And, and that I also know that they have the relationships that they need to get things to happen. Like, they're helping build the new LSI drivers for the 12 gigabit per second or 12 gigabyte per second SAS controllers. Ooh. You know, they, they have the beta before anybody else and they're oh. going to make sure that, and, like, and I'm just, it's like, I want that's that. Exactly, that's exactly what you want. Your, you want your hardware vendor in there yeah. learning about that stuff. Exactly. And that, you know, to know that if, if there's some pathology with my specific workload, because my workload is different than most people's, 
they'll be able to be like, hey, well, we happen to know a couple of engineers over at LSI mm -hmm. who, who who we could you know get some help from it and get this problem sorted out. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <coughs> ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And a really big thank you to IX Systems. Sure. All right, Alan, I feel like uh, I feel like we have a Heartbleed story in us. What do you think? What? No. No? Did I get, did I get the wrong? Oh, I did. No, it's That's this later. is the PDF. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Tell me a little bit about this story, because uh, this is the one that I downloaded the PDF over the mobile connection, which yep. worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I'm ready, Alan. Uh, okay. Educate me. All right, so this is uh, further research in the fine-grained cross-VM attack on Zen and VMware. Oh. So we talked a little bit about, uh, before about how... If you have access, if you have access to a VM that's on the same physical machine as someone else's VM, you might be able to steal their crypto keys. Yeah. Uh, well, these guys have have taken it even further. Uh, so researchers from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the states somewhere I'm not, I forget where that is uh, have published new research showing that cloud services, especially, are vulnerable to this type of thing. Mm. Uh, they say, quote, we show that the AES implementation in a number of popular cryptographic libraries, including OpenSSL, PolarSSL, and libgcrypt, which is used for uh, GNUPG, uh, are vulnerable to Bernstein's correlation attack. Uh, referring to Dan Bernstein, I think. Uh, so that when you're running Zen or VMware, the bare metal versions, not the one that's on top of a whole OS, but the ones that are that you know Amazon and Rackspace use, mm -hmm. uh, that the vulnerability persists even if the VMs are placed on different cores on the same machines. We, even if you lock the machines oh. so that, you know, my machine never shares the same physical core with your machine, right? I can still seal your, your crypto. That was always the trick. And now yep. that trick doesn't work. Yep. Uh, so th they say one of the ways to mitigate this is to use a separate machine for each different client. But that kind of breaks the entire point of the public cloud, right? Yeah, I mean, the virtualization is supposed to be getting you incredible density on yeah. you know less servers than you ever needed ever before. Yeah, and being able to scale up it was like, well, I if I have one VM and it's on one machine, I might as well just rent the whole machine. <laughs> <laughs> or if I have to rent the whole machine, then it it, yeah. it gets rid of the whole thing, mm -hmm. and it hurts the cost model for how uh, cloud works. Uh, they also found though that using the AES NI instruction. Uh, that's built into newer processors mitigates the attack entirely since it's never going through the RAM in the software. It just all gets done right in the, the CPU. Uh, however, many cloud providers are still using older machines that don't support ASNI, mm. right? The, especially Trying the to cheapest, eke out those investments. Uh, the cheapest Amazon instances run on old Opterons that don't have it. I see. Uh, they also found that newer versions of the crypto libraries, like newer OpenSSL, uh, mitigate attacks against the last round of the crypto, uh, but are still susceptible to attacks during the first round. Uh, so because of that, they're suggesting that uh, you use AES-256 instead of AES-128 uh, because AES-256 uses 14 rounds of crypto, whereas 128 only uses 10. Hmm. Okay. And uh, so the paper goes into more detail and talks about how it works and the different... <coughs> uh, methodologies they use to measure it and so if you were going to finding the difference between running it on the bare metal yeah. running it in a vm where it's only one vm running on the whole machine or once you get multiple vms on the same machine and how that changes things so let me ask you this if you were going to set up you know a scale engine uh vm service that people could rent mm -hmm. out machines for we, uh, <clears throat> would something like Beehive be susceptible to a problem like this um i don't know if Beehive passes through the aesni instruction yet or okay. not uh, so that's the, the general idea would be to allow the virtual machines to use AES and I uh, so that they're not vulnerable to this attack. Right. Gotcha. Interesting. And, uh, you know, a common question we've gotten on the TechSnap program. How many questions have we gotten? Hey, is it safe to run my file server and my firewall, my edge devices and my core network devices on the same VM if I have yep. physical NICs and things like that? Well, <clears throat> Yeah, so this that means if, if, you have your, if you have one physical machine that's running like your PFSense uh, on, in one VM and your web server in another, and someone compromises an app or whatever and gets access to your web server, if they can then steal the keys for your VPN, uh, then they could issue themselves a certificate and be able to connect your VPN and get inside your network more and, and things like that. So, so you'd have to have, <clears throat> I mean, you'd really have to be on the rig. I mean, you'd have to be on the box. Right, you'd have to basically... It's, you're less susceptible when you have your own private machines like that. It's In the public cloud instance, it comes down to, you know, can I get my VM to end up on the same physical machine as your VM? So it's very hard tar to target one specific person. 
but I can, you know, start up my VM, poke around and see who my neighbors are and see if I want to steal anything from any of them. Right. And if I don't, shut down the VM, start it up again, and it probably comes up on some other machine. Right. And just bounce around until I find someone whose key I might want to steal. Yeah. Or just try to steal every key I can. You know, it, it makes it's, it's very hard to be able to see, you know, oh, I'm going to try to target this one per specific person because I don't know where they live in the cloud. Right. That's a, that's what I was getting at is it seems like this would be particularly hard because you'd have to have some sort of you'd have to have some sort of knowledge of the virtual infrastructure layout to target anybody specific. Right. And and kind of by definition, the cloud is opaque. You can't see through it. You yeah. can't I you don't, don't know, know which physical yeah. machine you're on. I mean, Alan Jude might have a virtual instance on Rackspace, but I don't know that he's on server 125 out of right. 400 that might be in that data center. Right. Um, but I guess if I hung out long enough and waited around, uh, yeah. you would eventually find out. Yeah. I mean, if you and it depends also, do the machines move with live migrations? or? Oh, you know, right. It, but if it's long-lived and it stays on the same machine, how many times do you have to start and stop your VM before you might end up on the same machine as me? So I guess, is it uh, is it worth giving second thought before you set up one virtual box that has your edge and internal stuff? Like, if you have the potential um, for somebody to be... On machines, it's a l- less of an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh because, you know, they'd have to, like, completely root the, the one VM in order to try to steal something from the other VM. But, okay. Uh, right. It's still a bit of a question about using the public cloud, you know. Well, one of many. Yeah, yeah one of many. Uh, and, you know, part of where I come down on that, too, is, like, uh, <clears throat> this is... Uh, not to lead us into our next sponsor, but it kind of does, is this is where I'm coming down on this kind of stuff, is nowadays there is enough technolo- there's enough options out there for this that if if I'm not getting just full root access, if I, if I don't get to audit the processes that run on the box and all of that kind of stuff, and granted I can't get to the host level, but if it, even at the virtual level, if that is abstracted from me where I don't get to control the box, I think I'm out now. There's a, some services out there where it's you know you don't ever really get full control of it, and to me that just seems like well, you yeah, just don't it, have enough information. It basically, come down point. to the, there's no sense to use shared hosting ever anymore. Right to let anybody else's stuff run on the same machine. Yeah, I, I, I guess know. I guess that is kind of a damnation of shared hosting in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I want to know everything that's running on my machine. Now, do you know? Did they? I, I'm looking in here. I noticed in their diagram they have KVM listed, but do you know? Did they actually? Uh, I think they only tested Zen and VMware. And VMware because yeah. KVM can't be uh, bare metal. Right? So here is something. Ever, uh, KVM only runs on top of Linux. This information can be part of processes running on a co-resident guest OS, such as a visited website or possible key. Uh, see, they go here to say, looking right here. Um, visited websites and even downloaded files used by co-hosted guests on Linux-based KVM systems. So uh, it might be possible with KVM. Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to read some more. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very good. Very but good. Yeah, it, you know, separately saying that shared hosting is really not the way to go anymore because you can get a machine where you have root yeah, cheaper. Yeah, right, right. Like from our very own sponsor of this yes. week's TechSnap program, DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting. And I have to tell you, I've been a customer for a while now, and I'm pretty happy. And if you use the promo code SNAPAPRIL, you can get a $10 credit so you can try out DigitalOcean for free for two months if you get the $5 rig. Now, you're not familiar with DigitalOcean? Mm-hmm. Well, they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds, and pricing plans start only $5 per month. That gets you the 5 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, and I love the fact that they use SSDs, one mm-hmm. CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. Uh, DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is simple. It's in, They have an intuitive control panel that I just I can't rave enough about, and power users can replicate all of it at a much larger scale with their straightforward API. And this is, you know, going... That's one of the big differences. Most of the other bigger cloud places provide only a kind of cryptic API. Right. Whereas DigitalOcean is like, well, we give you this nice web interface so you can do most stuff, but if you really need the power, we have this nice API. Right. And uh, I like to, like, for example, uh, DigitalOcean is, is very fast to respond to these kind of security issues. They have a very good system in place to roll out new features. They just rolled out the new Ubuntu 14.04 support. Uh, yes. Those kinds of, you know, two-factor authentication, DNS management, they've rolled it out 
really intuitively, really well done. Uh, and you know, the fact that these drives are SSDs means that you can get a heck of a lot more system on one rig. Yep. You know, back in the day, I used to have these massive RAID arrays to get the throughput that I now get from a single SSD. And this is what I love is because I've got a DigitalOcean droplet that I've been running now for months and months, and it is a screamer. They have tier one bandwidth. They have great brand new hardware. They've got these SSD drives. They made an early investment in SSD, and they pair it all with this great interface. It really is a combo you've got to check out. Plus, developers love DigitalOcean because they also offer hourly pricing along with that API. So if yep. you want to just bang on something for a few hours, we had a uh, we had a listener uh, who who set up like this massive digital ocean rig to just do some software builds and he ran it for like 45 minutes to an hour and i think he ended up paying a dollar yeah <laughs> it's like okay well, well, it's like yeah it's like some of the instances are like what like seven cents an hour or yeah something. yeah it's, and it's, it's really like, nice well for my particular need right now i need five machines yeah for yeah. six hours yeah and that's it yep well renting five whole servers it's like well you have to rent them for at least a month it's like all of a sudden you're looking at this huge bill versus this tiny bill <laughs> Yeah, and if you use the promo code uh, Snap April, Snap April will get you that ten dollars credit. You can try the five dollar rig for two months for free, and you see yeah. what we've been or, talking about. Or you can try one of each of the rigs for a couple hours. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, and of course, of course, because it is a full installation, you get root access. So you yes. can monitor what's going on. You can see what's up. You get all of the information you need. And like me, you can take advantage of their droplet system. So once you get a system really set up that you like, make a droplet snapshot of it and then just deploy that in the future. And it's like, for me, it's like ready yep. to go. All my stuff is ready to go. And that's what I really Actually, love I was talking it. to someone on uh, the Mumble the other day and they had... It's all set, and then they messed up their Ubuntu upgrade. <laughs> and they're like, roll back? Yep. Nice. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> yeah, that's it, it is sort of like one way, too, Undo that I, I recommend that people try it for training. Like, yep. if you are getting into server administration or if you're about to try out a new project and you want a little bit of a safety net, yep. but you also want something that performs better than a VM and something yeah, that's much easier to hand out to other people. Exactly. If you're going to practice setting up a web server, doing that on a spare computer at your house isn't very useful because yeah. it's hard to let other people yeah. access the website. Yeah, so. or if you're building a site for a client and want them to be able to test exactly. it, you can throw it on Sorry. there. So go over to DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code SNAPAPRIL, you get that $10 credit, see what we've been raving about, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. We really appreciate it, and I really appreciate their service. It has been instrumental in my move to the new JB1 Studios. Having a go-between that I know I have access to from like yep. here or my house or on my Android device is like it has kept me productive during like the process of ripping out all of my hardware and moving it. That has been like my island of stabil stability. So a big thank you to DigitalOcean. Snap April. Go see what you guys can do and let us know what you build because I want to see it. I think that'd be really cool. All right, Alan. I think the news is all done, isn't yep. it? Well, guess what? As we were wrapping up, the internet just came back. Nice. Yeah, I knew it. I knew that would happen. I knew if we started, the internet would come back. So, you know what? Just in time, because now it's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to TechSnap at JupiterBroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting site or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Mr. Jude, our first email this week came in from Sean. Mm -hmm. And he was actually responding to an email from Brett from last week. Yep. And I like this. I like it when the community ch uh, you know, chimes in with their own solutions. So uh, Sean writes, hi, Chris and Alan. Well, hi, Sean. I thought I'd write in about how I solved a similar problem that Brett is having by backing up a bare metal system. Remember, Brett wanted bare metal restore. Mm -hmm. He says it serves as my desktop at work and as a only Linux and as the only Linux administrator in a rather large government agency. I don't want to look like an ass because my workstation is down. I've been running OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Oh, I've switched to this for two reasons: rolling release and snapper. My partition layout is like so. 2 gigabyte extended for boot, 80 gigabyte root, which is ButterFS, a 1 terabyte home, which is also ButterFS, and then he breaks out varlib MySQL and varlib KVM. I think those are also on the same, I think those are ButterFS. Right. He says, I've been using ButterFS for over a year now with no stability or data loss problems. The secret sauce is to this 
is to tracking the Linux stable release from the OpenSUSE build service. You get newer ButterFS features than the main distro release, but keep a stable base. For those who don't know what a, what Snapper is, it's a daemon that can be configured to automatically snapshot a ButterFS subvolume on a time schedule or in response to an event, such as a package installation. I then have a script that uses ButterFS to send and receive to my shuttle, snap, uh, shuttle snapshots onto an external disk. In the event that my OS config gets borked, I can tell Snapper to restore a snapshot. If something gets nuked badly, I can boot from the USB key and restore snapshots from my external drive. Uh, I'm only on the hook for rebuilding my slash boot manually, but I have a USB key that it can stand in. Mm-hmm. He says, I understand Brett is on Ubuntu, but all the technology is there. A uh, fancy bash script and a cron job can get you most of what Snapper does and a redundant disk for storing snapshots, of course. So sorry about the long post, but great work, guys. I've been hooked on TechSnap from episode one, and it's my favorite podcast since. Well, how about that? Yeah. Well, thanks for sending that in, Sean. But yeah, uh, basically the, the key to any kind of bare metal backup is snapshots. Yeah. You need some kind of file system that can do a snapshot. Yeah. Whether on, on FreeBSD, UFS has very basic snapshot support, oh, okay. specifically okay. so you can use the dump utility to get a consistent image of an entire partition. Uh, and then ZFS and ButterFS both have very rich support for snapshots. And the reason why this is a big deal, right, if you're backing up a 400 gig partition or something, well, you can't back up 400 gigs in zero seconds. Mm-hmm. So as you're backing it up, if files change, all of a sudden your backup isn't consistent, right? You have the version of the file before and then the other related file that depends on the first file is from a different time. And so there's a change and the files are inconsistent and it won't work anymore. Or worse, you're backing up a database or something and you're backing up, you have half the file before somebody made a change and half the file after <laughs> yeah. somebody made a change yeah. and Especially the on entire a file is unusable. Yeah, yeah. snapshots... Uh, are are like yeah. the greatest thing ever. Exactly. As long as you have the storage space for them. Yeah. And you uh, got a plan for that. And there's great. Uh, the tool I use on uh, FreeBSD is ZFS dash snapshot dash management. Oh. Uh, and or MGMT, but uh, it's in the parse tree, and basically, it allows you to say a schedule. So it's take a snapshot every 15 minutes. Yeah. Keep those for four hours. After that, only keep the ones that are divisible by an hour. So only keep the ones from the top of each hour. And then, you know, for three days, and after that, only keep the ones from noon each day for like a month or whatever. So uh, Mac, Mac Nod Zero, I'm, not, I'm probably not, mm-hmm. definitely not saying that right. He's asking about performance characteristics of ButterFS. I've, I haven't used no it extensively, idea. but I, I will say, you know, from my casual observations, having used it for about a year now on various systems, it seems quite performant until... And this is where I noticed a huge change in performance, and I'd, I've heard others repeat the same thing, uh, when I got the drive really close to full. Yeah. Well, that, that's basically a problem with any copy-on-write file system, is that fragmentation happens when you get full, and it yeah. becomes harder to find blocks of free space. ZFS has spent a lot of time in the last two years working on that specific problem and improving it, and it's better, but... In the end, there's not necessarily a solution. And when you're using spinning disks, the seeking and stuff is more expensive. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they kind of naturally tend towards some, like SSDs solve a lot of the problems. Yeah. But at the same time, ZFS was specifically designed for, well, I need a huge amount of storage. So I don't want SSDs. I want lots and lots of spinning disks. I, uh, I also, on my slash home, have mm-hmm. been doing compression for that year. Yeah. And it's worked uh, great. Yeah, compression can actually end up giving you that speed advantage, especially if you're dealing with like source code and you can compress it a lot or just text files or mm-hmm. whatever you got. Even raw video compresses very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can actually, because you're compressing it before you write it to the disk, you can achieve a higher throughput than is physically possible. I got i7s. Yeah. Why not take advantage of it? Yeah, and you know, with like LZ4 that's used in, in ZFS, yeah. the compression rate is like, 500 megabytes a second per core on like a 1.4 gigahertz, like a cheap Celeron or something. I'll take that. A laptop can press at, wow, like 500 megabytes per core and you have multiple cores, right? And and then your decompression rate is huge. It's like two gigabytes a second. <laughs> and so that means reading that file back, you can get speeds that are just physically impossible normally, mm-hmm. right? That that spinning hard drive can't do more than 150 megabytes a second, but I'm reading from it at a gigabyte a second because 
I'm reading 150 and then decompressing it right. and getting the higher speed. And using my RAM and CPU to do some of the heavy lifting. Exactly. Uh, all right. EB writes in. Uh, he says, he's got a question for us. He says, thanks for all your hard work, putting out a great show week after week. Your careful explanations have taught me much, and I'm greatly interested in your thoughts on the matter that is close to home. I have three children who have been spending an increasing amount of time online for school and entertainment. Everything from Minecraft, YouTube, they're on laptops with Mac and Linux, they're on the iPad, the iPhone, a Nexus, tablet sometimes. He says, I do my best to be vigilant about their online footprints, but this can be a challenge when children are determined and when they outnumber the adults. I will speak from personal experience too, like, uh, you know, sometimes my kid will grab an iPad and he'll walk off and like... I'll come follow, I'll go find where he's at because he's been quiet for a long time. Like, why is he being quiet? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he's on YouTube. And so far, like, nothing bad has happened, but it definitely, it raised some of these same red flags that EB's talking about. I remember uh, at BSD Cairn, I was talking to Matt Olander and he got a a ping on his cell phone. It's like, my daughter somehow managed to get past the lockout and ordered something from Amazon on the Kindle. (laughs) Oh, yeah. The Kindle is a cash register, yeah. man. <laughs> That's what the Kindle is. Yeah. He says, I'm interested in employing some technology to draw some lines around their screen time. Ideally, I would restrict access by the device they use past a certain hour to the internet. Metrics on what online games they are playing and how long they are, are on would also be a bonus, but not necessary. Mm-hmm. Would something like PFSense or DDWRT do the job? Thanks again for your time and your advice. EB. I think so. Uh, basically, f- for per device, you can use the MAC address. Uh, because when you're on the local LAN, you get that with each packet. Sure. And so you could say, you know, certain ad- devices only allowed on the internet at, uh, up to certain hours of the day, and then they get cut off or something. Um, what about, I mean, what about doing a combination of PFSense with OpenDNS, right? Because OpenDNS will let you set time restrictions. It'll let you do category restrictions. It'll even give you some stats. Yes. Uh, the problem with the OpenDNS is it can't tell which device you're using. Yeah. You'd have to like, you'd ha- EB would have to have like his own machine using like Google DNS or something. Yeah. Right. And uh, <laughs> as soon as the kids don't figure out how to, to use Google DNS directly. Yeah. Uh, that's true. And so that's why doing it on the PFSense where you have absolute control is easier. I don't know if there's a module to do time. I'm, I, I would assume there is. Maybe. Uh, but... And if not, then I'm sure DDWRT would have one. And if not, I f- I'm very surprised no one has done that yet. I feel like it's a one-two combo, possibly. Yep. And if you could set on the Nexus device to open DNS2, then it would work even when you're out on the road. Yeah, well, you can configure the DHCP server to hand that out. Yeah, oh, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, that would be a way to do it, right? D- everything on DHCP gets open DNS, and then EB could set his machine to a static IP yep. with whatever DNS server he wants. Yeah, and things like that. Um, there was something else I was going to mention. Oh, for tracking time, mm-hmm. uh, I use this app called Rescue Time. Now, I use it specifically to keep track of my own time just s- for informational purposes. Uh, but they have a team version and stuff like that that's designed for uh, using uh, with groups. And, it, you know, it can uh, – I used it a lot when I was working as a consultant because you can keep track of where you spend all your time on your computer, in, in like to the level of in my – uh, IDE, it would track which file I was working on and the whole path of that file. And because I had a directory structure that told me, uh, it told me the directory the file was in and I had a different directory for each client, I'd be like, oh, I spent this block of time working on stuff for oh, this client. Oh, that's cool. And so good I could billing, use it for billing, too. yeah. yeah. Um, and actually we make our, uh, Lloyd, my code writing minion that I have, uh, he does that? He uses that, and that's how we pay him. <laughs> uh, Silver51 in the chat room is also pointing out Dan's Guardian, mm-hmm. which is a web con- fi- content filter that runs on Linux or BSD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this could be another route to go. It's more of the actual web content filtering because you can block certain types of categories as sites and things like that. And I think it also, uh, Dan's Guardian also does the time restrictions. That so that could be another that could be another way to drive that. I don't know if you could load that on a PF Sense box, but I, if it says it runs on BSD, I'm sure somebody would turn that into a a, a, oh, a plugin. Packet. Yeah, yeah. So Dan's Guardian, Open DNS, and PF Sense. I bet you there's a sweet spot in there, EB. Yep. Uh, I I have so far for uh, our house been using Open DNS because. I'm not so worried. I, I manually enforce the time restrictions. I just take away the iPads at a yeah. cer- after a certain time. Um, 
So uh, as long as well, OpenDS that, that is blocking, that works when you can put them on a high shelf. And yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, and your kids are yeah. small enough. But right, but like when I'm when they're older and I'm not in the house, like I'm right, maybe exactly. I'm here at work, right? They're not necessarily gonna. I'm not exactly. gonna stop them. Yeah. Uh, but I I could with OpenDNS still. Like I think I could go in there and just turn it off too. Yeah. So Odad writes in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says forking open a cell. It's a bad idea. Uh, this would be a good email for next week. But yep. keep this in mind. We're going to talk more about Heartbleed next week. He says yep. yes. There are problems with open SSL, but saying let's create a lean open SSL just for us is stupid because of two reasons. Number one, you will not get updates from upstream, uh, which splits up the developer workforce and causes fragmentation. You well, know. Th- that's not necessarily true, right? It's a fork. That doesn't mean you can't keep importing from upstream. It's like people, like there are lots of forks where they purposely do keep pulling updates from the upstream or yeah. downstream or however That's you true. It that. depends on how much they fork it, huh? Right. How much they change it. You know, obviously they can look at this patch and be like, oh, that applies over here or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, keep reading. All right. Number two, removing Heartbleed and other features because, or Heartbeat and other features because they're not being used from a framework library is really, really wrong. The way you add features to a protocol is you first add the feature to the frameworks and then the applications will start supporting it. E.g., no browser supported SNI until Apache Mod SSL started started supporting it, even though it was a really, really important feature. If you remove heartbeat support from OpenSSL, it's basically saying, we don't want that feature to ever be used. But if you can explain to me why you want the heartbeat feature, maybe. It, it, it's Heartbeat is a bad example. And it's like, yes. SNI was something everybody needed. Right. Heartbeat isn't. Right. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this uh, next time. But the main reason they had to fork it is because the changes they're making wouldn't be accepted upstream, mm-hmm. right? So they, they looked at just fixing open SSL, and it wasn't really an option. Right. Uh, and Silver51 in the chat room is saying that uh, PFSense, because us- he uses Dan's Guardian, PFSense current does have an installation for Dan's Guardian awesome. in the PFSense box. Cool. So there you go, EB. That'd be really great. All right, Tim writes in, with a tricky home printing scenario. I'm surprised we don't get more printing questions. Yeah. Printing is like the bane of yeah. everything. Well, you know what You know what used to, on also modem setup used to be a pain in the butt? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't get any of those. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Tim says, hey, Chris and Alan. First of all, let me take my turn to say a huge thank you for providing such a great show every week. Oh, thanks, Tim. Listening to TechSnap in the car is my absolute favorite way to learn things about computing and keep up with the news and technology. Love hearing that. Yep. He says, I'm writing in about home a, a home printing rig that I set up a while ago. I have a Canon USB all-in-one that does not play nice with my desktop that runs Debian. The printer has some nice features and I was resolved to keep it. So I set up a slim down VM running Windows XP to host and share my printer on my LAN. The USB port is forwarded to the machine and I bridge the network interface with my desktop's Ethernet card. I'm currently content with the functionality. I've even scripted a tool to start and stop the VM when I need to print so I'm not always wasting system resources. Mm -hmm. But my question is this. Given the demise of XP, how urgent is it from a security standpoint that I rework my configuration? Or are there some simple steps I could take to further protect my network from gaping holes that might appear? The VM never has to boot past the login screen in order to process my print jobs. And since I only fire it up when I need to print, I'm inclined to think the security risk is almost negligible but i wanted to ask you guys for your input thanks again keep up the great work tim yeah it's not exposed to the internet so it should be okay you might change instead of bridging it to your whole lan you might switch it to use a host only adapter and connect only to the host machine uh so that it never has access to the internet Yeah, if you don't need to print from another machine right uh but yeah as long as it's not exposed to the internet it shouldn't be bad you're not running a browser or anything on it where you're going to be exposed to a java or Flash exploit or something. Yeah, I mean, for Tim okay. to worry, right? So first of all, if he's using a Debian desktop, it's not like he's going to download some sort of malware through an explorer that's going to scan his whole LAN and find XP and then exploit that XP machine. Right. So the, the machines that are on the edge are already a safer caliber of OS. So that's one thing that, you're, that you have good in your favor. And then number two, dude, you're powering that thing on and off. Like, all you got to do is take a snapshot when you know it's in a good state and then if anything, anything ever were to happen, just revert the snapshot. Exactly. And I don't or always revert the snapshot. Yeah, you could. Right? You can you have the snapshot and just run it. And when you're done printing, you turn it off and you say, don't save the changes. 
Yeah, I, I, I actually think it's frozen. I think this is probably how a lot of businesses that are probably in your same situation need to think about this. The one possible scenario you might be able to go through is kind of bouncing off what Alan was saying is you could set up cups on your Debian rig to print to a Samba share. And so you could do the host only adapter so that only the cups installation on your Debian rig that the VM runs on is seen by the by the local host. And then you could have cups accept print jobs from every machine on your network and forward it over Samba to that host through that host only adapter to yeah. the Windows box if you wanted, but that seems like yeah. overkill to me. You know, well, I don't want to tell anybody that they don't have to get rid of their XP yeah, machine. I know, right? Yeah. Your little VM that you don't leave running and don't ever log into should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to worry about Just it. Just make sure it doesn't touch the internet. I'm or glad more Tim... More specifically, that the internet never touches it. Right. Yes. I'm glad Tim's thinking about this. And the fact also, yep. uh, the fact that he included that little tidbit that, that it, it never logs in, which means yep. there's like pretty much no desktop session running on that thing. Exactly. I think you're pretty safe. Yep. All right. Colvin writes in. Uh, following up, we had a user, and you're not going to believe this one. Like I should have, I should have caught this. Uh, we had a he, we had a user write in. He had this uh, uh, arch problem where ZFS was read only on his laptop, mm -hmm. and I said, well, you know, we don't really probably have the solution because uh, you know we need more information. Yeah, you're running you're running that. ZFS on Arch, and we get we have a lot of questions. Turns out. It was way simpler than I was thinking, and I'm glad Calvin caught it. He says, I sent in a message last week about having issues with Arch on ZFS, and I don't think I brought it on the show. I think it was just back and forth. I privately emailed him. He mm -hmm. says, uh, my pool was mounting read-only. I finally tracked it down to my grub.cfg in the Linux directive. It should end with an RW for read-write, which I had admitted, and so it assumed read-only when it would mount it. Mm -hmm. Once I added RW, and he includes the uh, line here if you're watching mm -hmm. the video version, my problem was solved. I just want to give you an update as you expressed interest in a ZFS Arch server yourself. Thanks for the awesomeness. Call yeah. So there you go. So yeah, uh, but normally that just makes it read-only in single-user mode, and once it finishes booting, it would mount normally, but... Uh, that's ZFS and I think it's a, I think nice Linux is well so yeah because see what he's doing is his root is ZFS and right. or ZFS and so I think that like if it was like a slash home that was ZFS or slash var I don't think right. it's a problem but like in FreeBSD when you boot in single user mode your slash is read only right, and yeah. then when you get up into multi user mode it's not anymore right but I guess that's FS tab remounting it yeah so yeah uh, I can yeah. see how that yep yeah. yep there you go. All right. So we'd love to get your feedback. Uh, we're doing two tech snaps this week. So that means we've gone through all our emails. Yeah, we're like out of emails. We're out of them. So go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. Choose tech snap from the drop down. And then our robots will package it up into some sort of special robot bundle. I don't know. It's patent pending from Google. And then deliver it to all of the correct places automatically. That part, that part's not patent pending. Uh, but you can still take advantage of it. You can also go to our brand new subreddit. Just launched it today, links.techsnap.tv, and start a thread there, and then the rest of the community can chime in and get you an answer maybe a little quicker than we could, too. Yep. All right, Alan, with the feedback all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup are stories that just didn't fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them and give you some links to follow up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. I don't know how. It's brand new. We just launched it today. But, Alan, I actually didn't find our first story on the subreddit. I found it. Uh, I think I was I think I was trolling another subreddit. I don't uh -huh. I don't remember where I found it. Bitcoins, Alan. So, of course, yeah. it caught my eye, right? Bitcoins and Chrome, two things that I'm all in on these days. Um this one uh, just makes me shake my head. There is now a Chrome extension as of this recording that is still in the Chrome Web Store that steals your Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go figure. And here it's here's what I love about it. It's a Dogecoin live ticker. <laughs> so it's for tracking Dogecoin. Uh, the extension is available right now. Uh, and here's what it does. It takes your wallet address and it just simply replaces the developer's address in there. So when you try to send money to your own wallet, it just quickly swaps uh, in the developer of the extension's address, so you send the so money to him. it's not actually stealing your Bitcoins, because right. it's assuming you don't have any. <laughs> well, I guess. It just tries to intercept every time you want to send right. some to yourself. Or if you're moving funds around, I suppose. Yeah, if you're trying to yeah. withdraw from a mining pool or, a, or now, a exchange or something. What's kind of bogus, I think, and I know 
Google doesn't really vet the the Chrome extensions, but like there's like uh, a whole bunch of reviews in here that it's like, oh, except for this guy at the bottom, great effort, really useful. <laughs> that guy got scammed, but the rest are all like one star, don't use, don't install. This is this is spyware. Yeah. So I guess because Google, but how recent are some of? Those? If all those are only a day old, then. three days, three oh. days, three days, one day, and then February twelfth. Uh, great effort. Yeah, really so they had five stuff. stars for a long time. Yeah, yeah. 620 people have it installed according to uh, the tracker too. So here's the thing. That's it, a really small number. Yeah, it is. And it's not getting wide adoption. I just, I wanted to kind of get the word out there while it's still bubbling yeah. up. And the other thing too is like, remember Google's not vetting these. Yep. So check those reviews because in this case, if yep. you were, 620 yep. people could have avoided some 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 pain if, yep. if they had read those reviews. Uh, so... I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, like Eric uh, Ick points out in the chat room, uh, what's going on? What's the deal with the Chrome Web Store? Mm-hmm. All right. Speaking of browsers, our next story is a Mozilla story about a bug bounty. Yes. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, A, it's not just we'll give you money if you find a bug. It's will you please look at this new chunk of code and find the bugs, and if you do, we'll give you money. So they're offering bug bounties on code that's not even released. Yes. Uh, so Mozilla is offering a $10,000 bug bounty to incentivize people to audit uh, the new certificate verification library that they want to ship in a future version of Firefox. So this is code that's not even in Firefox yet, but they want to put it in Firefox, and they would like to have it audited first. Genius. I mean, yeah. like, it seems so obvious on its face, but yet nobody does this. Yeah. Why not bang on it before it gets out into public hands, before exactly. it's a big PR disaster? Before, yeah, before you have to do vulnerability announcements, be like, yeah. hey, everybody, hold on, wait, watch, there's a bug in that, and it's going to expose Other, Otherwise, we're going to be reading your postmortem right here on TechSnap. Exactly. So, yeah, <laughs> they're like, here, we'll give access to the code first, and we'll offer a big bounty if you find a bug. Uh, our next roundup story caught my attention because I kind of got on my soapbox the last couple of weeks and I was like uh, this Heartbleed vulnerability it's on the industry it's on you Google it's on you Amazon it's on you 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 anybody out there who's making millions of dollars off the back of OpenSSL this vulnerability is on you you guys should have come together you should have audited this code you should have worked to fund this development well guess what Guess what? It actually happened. Uh, key tech titans are coming together. Tech titans, you like that? Uh, to launch a, something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. Um, it's made up of Google, Intel, Cisco, and Microsoft, which I didn't even really know Microsoft used OpenSSL. It's starting with OpenSSL. It's going to expand well, there's beyond a bunch of other companies in there. I think yeah. Dell and yeah, a bunch of other places. Down, yeah, uh, let's see down here. Uh, Amazon, Cisco, Dell, Facebook, Fujitsu, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, NetApp, Rackspace, and VMware are all involved. Yep. Um, and so this is what's interesting about this is it's starting with OpenSSL. And here's the part that I wanted to ask you about, Alan. Uh, they are essentially managing it through the Linux Foundation. Yep. So the money's going to go to the Linux Foundation and then the Linux Foundation is going to hand this out. Are you yeah, comfortable with it? It sounds like uh, they're talking about doing fellowships. Uh, so they basically pay someone to work full-time on working on a certain project or something. And that can work. Um, it, I, it really depends on some of the politics involved. You know, are yeah. they going to be... You know, they can only work on code that's going to be released under the GPL or something. Well, uh, does this inherently... Does that... Yeah, yeah uh, this is not a Linux open problem. S- yeah, OpenSSL already has its own license, and they can't change that. So it's, yeah, it's so not GPL. It's yeah. not even specifically Linux code. Right. So so that doesn't have me as worried there. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So you think that's a good? To me, it seemed like a mismatch. It seems like the Linux well, a Foundation. Little bit, yeah, uh, the Linux Foundation doesn't necessarily seem like the best place, but they have infrastructure already. Right. Whereas starting a new foundation, it would take them a long time. And they have they have a trusted brand. And the other thing is yeah. is like. Um, I do think Linux took a bit of a PR beating over this, and yep. uh, it seems like if if you're going to have some neutral third party, where when you can have Facebook and Google working together on something, you're you're going to have to have somebody step up and take that on. And right. the thing is, is the Linux Foundation already has relationships with all these companies, right? And they already have everything set up to handle the money, and they already yeah. have. So it's just. It, it, take so much time and effort to set up a new foundation called the Core Infrastructure Foundation or something. Right. And yeah, it'd be like, you know, IBM and HP arguing over who should be in charge. Right, and yeah. And so in this case, it kind of solves a lot of those problems. This is good. Uh, this is this But is it's, good. it's like, how, how are they going to pick which projects at the same time? It's like, 
I would say that OpenSSH is just as important as OpenSSL. Right. But nobody ever gives any money to that. Well, that, I mean, I think the fact that they called it core infrastructure is a good sign. I mean, it, yeah. a lot of things fall under that. Yeah, but they didn't, the, it was interesting they didn't mention what any of the other ones would be like. The first thing we're going to look at is OpenSSL. It's like, well, what else? Though? Well, hey, don't you, you got to figure like this came together pretty quick. These are companies that I don't think are known for moving very fast. And right. yet they all just got in on this in the last couple of weeks. Right. But, so, you know, with that number of companies, the, the number can be small enough that it just takes one person at Google who has yeah. enough authority to allocate that amount yeah. of money. Yeah. Well, uh, all right. Let's talk about, while we're talking about Cisco, let's talk about, well, Cisco is going to help out the FBI and law enforcement, aren't they? They want to help make, it a, make uh, intercepting your IP packets a standard. Yeah. So RFC 3924. Oh, rolls off the tongue. Architecture for lawful interception of IP <laughs> networks. <laughs> Uh, basically, they found that governments all over the world are passing laws saying that, you know, they have to be able to intercept certain traffic, you know, wiretapping Skype calls or whatever it is. Sure, of course. And uh, Cisco's like, well, the law is different in every country. We need just kind of a standard way of addressing it. Ah. And hmm. so uh, they're trying to come up with a set of, of a standard on how they will address uh so, so this is helping the government spy on people. So at the moment. RFC level, this is something that wouldn't necessarily just be limited to Cisco products, right? Well, they're making this an open standard, right? Well, basically, RFC stands for Request for Comment. Yeah, it's like I think we would do it this way. What does everybody else think? And it invites people to give feedback. It and just eventually, feels a little dirty. It becomes to me. a protocol. Feels a little dirty to me. Yes, it uh, is. Uh, standardizing spying on you. Yeah, and and you could almost argue that um, before this was suggested. Uh, maybe one of the benefits of the I, of the IP protocol was that it didn't have this built in, right? right? <laughs> well, this isn't actually, I, they're not proposing changing the IP protocol. Oh, okay. Anything, right? This okay. is just a new standard specifically for this. Oh, uh, okay. Um, okay. And possibly, it might be that, you know, certain governments want to be able to have a standard way to yeah. intercept traffic so that they're yeah. not forced to always buy Cisco gear, even if Cisco's the only person that ever implements this standard because it's a standard. Right. That, you know, there might be, it, this could all just be come down to like the way certain governments require companies to bid on stuff. It's yeah, like we refuse to to be vendor locked in, so we want an yeah. open standard. And uh, yeah, mm. it's hard to say yeah. exactly what's going on. There, <clears throat> well, we'll keep an eye on it. Yep. And uh, if something interesting happens, and if it gets some but traction, it, it's it's got an interesting summary of you know <laughs> Cisco trying to explain why they have to do this. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Is it well, like it's in the the? Oh, I just for, closed like, the summary of the uh, article. Uh, I uh, I'll reopen that. Okay. I, let's see here. Uh, let's see. For the purposes of this document, lawful interception is the lawfully authorized interception of monitoring of communication. Service providers are being asked to meet legal and regulatory requirements for interception of voice as well as data communications and IP networks of a variety of countries worldwide. Although requirements vary from country to country, some requirements remain common, even though details is such as the delivery and the format may differ. This document describes Cisco's architecture for supporting lawful interception and IP networks. It provides a general solution that has a minimum set of common interfaces. This document does not attempt to address any of the specific legal requirements or obligations that may exist in any particular country. You know, like those pesky constitutions. Yeah. Things like that. <laughs> awesome. Great. Keep up the good work, Cisco. Uh, all right. So I thought this one was interesting just in kind of the grand scheme of these legal battles we see going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Android is just a, an exploding platform. It's number one installed platform now uh, for like pretty much any computing device, like in numbers. And so, of course, it continues to just get pounded on by the incumbents in, if in the patent co uh, courses uh, cases. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something that gives you a little insight. Uh, a lot of people have speculated that Apple suing Samsung was sort of a proxy battle between Apple and Google, and that by going after Samsung, Apple was essentially building a case to go after Google or kind of trap Google into a box. And, and to try to scare other uh, yeah. handset vendors yeah. from going with Google. And pay those Microsoft licenses and things like that. Well, it turns out that Google's feeling the heat, uh, at least if you're to kind of take it away from this. Uh, there was an email that came out in the recent court hearings. Uh, Google's attorney, James McCoon, confirmed that Google and Samsung exchanged email messages in which Google offered to help cover Samsung's legal expenses and possible damage payments and offered indemnity on some of the patent infringement for which Apple is uh, suing. The email notes that Google is legally entitled to offer this 
Help as part of its contractual obligations to Samsung, its biggest hardware partner in the world. So, essentially, Google's saying, all right, guys, I, I think you got a solid it's, case, but if you, yeah. get, if you get screwed, we'll help cover the bill. Yeah, it's, it's specifically Google trying to get Samsung not to accept a Right. Deal. Exactly. It's like continue fighting this out. Yes. Don't accept a deal. And, yeah. And you know, Samsung's like, well, there's a risk. If we continue fighting, we might lose. And right. Google's like, well, we'll help with that. I don't th- worry. Yeah. I think Samsung's a little nervous right now, and so Google's like, oh, we got your back, buddy. Yeah. It's okay. We're rich. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Kind of, it's getting a little dirty. Uh, all right. I love this one, Alan. You threw this one in the roundup. It's the design flaw that almost wiped out a New York City skyscraper. Yeah, and so it's basically, you know, an engineer designed something, and then when it was actually being built, the builder cut some corners, made some changes, what? make it cheaper. No. And then it turned out that, you know, if the wind blew in a certain direction, the building would fall over. You're kidding. Yeah. Uh, and and so then, you know, uh, apparently a student uh, noticed this when he was looking at the drawings or something. He was like an apprentice or something on the uh, during the building, and yeah. he noticed the problem, and he brought it to the original architect and and they agreed that yes this is actually is a problem (laughs) and so he had a social responsibility to deal with the problem oh yeah right and they talk about you know how they worked with the new york city police to actually have an evacuation plan in case the wind ever started doing that uh (laughs) it was going to cause the building to fall over because they'd have to evacuate the building and the ones beside it and stuff wow uh and then (coughs) how they worked and they had workers come in every night and start welding and, and making changes so that the building wouldn't be vulnerable, but they would only work on it at night, not while there were people in the building. Sure. And stuff. Yeah. And uh, so it's kind of an interesting story about how, you know, For the, implementa- every- the design is separated from the implementation and it's often not the same person doing in it. In tech or or construction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is just general engineering of any kind. Yeah. And how that little change they made over here to make their job easier right. actually ruins the whole design yeah. because of the problem but also how the designer kind of has this so- social obligation to fix the problem when he becomes aware of it yeah uh so here, look at this line from the article uh for every year the city group center building was standing there was about a one in 16 chance it would collapse yeah. <laughs> man that's that's i don't even run my servers at that kind of risk level i mean mm. come on give me a break uh, all right, uh, our next roundup story, the entire internet is blowing up about it today. It is the number one story on every forum, every news site I went to, and unfortunately, it is not a good one. Um, the new FCC chairman, who used to work in the mobile industry and in the cable industry, and then got in as the FCC chairman, announced today that they're considering setting up a fast lane. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission said that on Wednesday, that was yesterday, that it would propose new rules that allow companies like Disney, Google, or Netflix to pay internet service providers like Comcast and Verizon for special, faster lanes to send video and other content to their customers. Ooh. Tom Wheeler, the FCC chairman, defended the agency's plans late Wednesday, saying speculation that the FCC was gutting the open Internet rule is just flat out wrong. Rather, he said the new rules will provide for net neutrality. Uh, the New York exactly Times. the opposite. Of I know. Like he's living in an opposite world. The New York Times uh, goes on to note that the rules are also likely to eventually raise prices for customers as the likes of Disney and Netflix will just pass on the cost, the cost of that fast lane to their customers, mm-hmm. um, which, of course, they will because if they have to pay more to transmit the data. Exactly. So, Alan, you stream a lot of data. Mm-hmm. You stream a lot of video. Jupiter Broadcasting is one of them. Yep. Uh, are you worried about companies like Scale Engine? For sure. Because basically it would Comcast would be like, we're going to purposely make the experience of our users suck so that you have to pay us extra. Well, and even if you're just in the overall everybody pool that is just the same for everything yep. and not in that faster lane, then uh, you know, you're already a disadvantage. And I'll give you, yeah. it's, it's, here's an example and, of- And one of our giant competitors can afford to pay right, for that exa- fast lane yeah. and we can't. Well, here's an example of something that's already kind of happened in a way. It's not this same thing, but it's the beginning echoes of it. Uh, Netflix streaming. On the Roku and um, on on like every device except for Apple TV, it's streamed like from you know the whatever setup they have. Maybe it's the Netflix CDN box. Maybe yep. it's directly from Netflix. On Apple TV, 
on Apple TV, Apple has a special deal, I guess, with Netflix, and they actually are streaming Netflix content from the Akamai CDN. Mm -hmm. So on Apple TV, I don't know, I haven't tried this, but on Apple TV, supposedly the Netflix streams start up faster and go high definition faster with less buffering because Apple has essentially bought a fast lane for streaming. Kind of. yeah. It's not so, the same thing, but you can see the beginnings right. of it. Yeah. Well, Akamai is basically doing the same thing as a Netflix CDN box, but they've been doing it for 15 years, so they have a bit of a head start. And so the experience is, is well, Netflix plays better on my Apple TV than it does on my Roku. And Roku yeah. is not financially in a spot where they could pay for all of their customers to stream that video. Exactly. So, uh, and when you get this fast lane, I, I am really worried because, for example, maybe... Yeah, th but it really comes down to, you know, Comcast saying that we need this so that we can compete with Netflix and Google. It's like, well, so they specifically want this to disadvantage Netflix and Google, right? It's like, yep, no, it's this has got to be, you're just the it plumbing. Yeah. You know, Comcast shouldn't be allowed to own the media and provide you the internet at the same time. Anyway. NBC. Yeah. But basically Comcast needs to be broken up and uh, probably some of the other cable companies too and separate the internet from any kind of media at all. Yes. And the internet is just deliver packets and you're not allowed to even look at them you know you can't discriminate right yes deliver the packets just be a dumb be a dumb pipe yep that's what i, I you know what and i'll gladly pay for a dumb pipe like yep. i don't know why they don't want to be that i know they just want to keep selling more stuff on top of it because they have to be huge corporations that own the entire market but really i just want a dumb pipe yep um all right so any of you out there that use net support manager some bad news for you huh alan yeah there was a vulnerability in net support manager that could allow an attacker to steal data so Net Support Manager is a way uh, to remotely manage uh, desktops and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, guy found a couple of vulnerabilities. Uh, excuse me, a couple of vulnerabilities in it, and then those came out. And then uh, he later improved the vulnerability even more <laughs> to the point where the user doesn't even know that their machine is being taken oh. over. So instead of having to use the tools, you can actually just use Nmap now and like take over a machine or something. Are you serious? Yeah, looks pretty cool. I got Nmap right here, so I'm good to go. <laughs> okay, so we have a link in the roundup if you're a Net Manager user. Yep. Uh, our next story in the roundup: poor patching, weak credentials, open the door to data breaches, says Verizon. Yes. Uh, so Verizon had their data breach investigations report. Uh, Verizon has this unit that goes around and investigates when there's these data breaches. They look into how it happened and the, do the postmortem and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then they compiled the data from all the customers that paid for that, and the found that the most common causes of breaches are not applying the patches and having weak passwords. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. And then like when uh, and then when you take it away from that, I think the next thing in their list was the exploitation of some sort of remote desktop software, but that was actually yeah. way lower, way lower on the list than like bad passwords. Yeah, but that kind of applies to our previous story yep. about Net Support Manager. Yep, exactly. So uh, Verizon released a, a crazy PDF um, it's got like all these kind of charts and stuff. I tried to read through it, but I kept falling asleep because it was early this morning. Uh, and that's what I took away from it is like, still today, after everything we've talked about, after everything everybody's talked about, it still comes down to freaking passwords. And patches. And patches. And then remote desktop. Yeah. But remote desktop was a was a distant third. On yeah. And list. remote desktop is usually only vulnerable when? Bad passwords. Weak password. <laughs> yes. Uh, guess what? Surprise, DDoS, or DDoS attacks are increasing. Are you surprised? Well, specifically, it's more that the attacks are increasingly being used rather than to disable a service to either distract the administrators or to cover up the fact that some theft or fraud is occurring. Right? So they're, they're while they steal something, they start a DDoS so that people are busy looking at the DDoS and not noticing the, uh, the theft of data or the fraud that happened. <laughs> right to delay, delay the discovery of the theft or the fraud yeah. long enough to make it easier to get away with. I feel like I've seen this happen a lot in a in a in a more micro version in in the Bitcoin community. Yep. Yeah, using it to disable the exchange, yeah. to drive the prices in different directions. Jam or, the logs, yep. distract people, rise the prices, drop yep. the prices, buy, sell, all yep. that kind of stuff. And DDoS have been the key. remember uh, we talked about it uh, when a bank got hacked into uh, with the wire transfer system. Right. They then did a DDoS to distract the administrators. Right. So they, because basically, if they don't notice within a certain amount of time, it's harder to get the money back. Yeah. Right? Because once the money gets to the bank where they wired it, then they move it around and move it around and eventually... Uh, get it out and it's not possible to, for the bank to claw it back. Right. If But if they can notice within the first so many hours, they can claw the money back. Uh, but they use the DDoS to 
delay the discovery long enough that uh, they were able to get away with it. Pretty tricky. Yep. Simple attack, something that I think a lot of people brush off as, oh, that's just kitty stuff. But you can actually, when applied correctly, yeah, basically use it for just cover. Just use it for a distraction. Yeah. yeah. That's good stuff. All right. Well, links to everything we talked about in today's show is in the show notes and essentially listed out in the chronological order that we went through this stuff um, and including uh, all of the emails for the feedback and all that kind of good stuff. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and look for tech stamp 159. And also, while you're there, why not grab the RSS feed and then just get the show weekly and you don't have to worry about it. You just put in your favorite podcast client and download it. And do me a solid. If you're an iTunes user, please give us a rating and a comment. Yes. That helps other people find us. And we don't, Jupiter Broadcasting doesn't have a lot of iTunes users, so we kind of need all of you who are using iTunes to hook us up with that because you are our small army that can help other people discover it. Because the one thing iTunes is, amongst all the other things, the one thing iTunes is, is a fantastic podcast discovery platform for a lot of brand new users, a lot of people out there looking for sysadmin type material and things like that. So please do us a solid and do that. Or if you want to just help another way, you can help defer the bandwidth by grabbing the torrent feed and downloading the show over BitTorrent. Yeah. But yeah, iTunes. Yeah. Helps, helps. spread the word. Yeah. It helps spread the word. Uh, all right, Alan, is there anything else we want to cover before we wrap up today? Uh, no. Well, we should just tell people to watch us live. Join us over at jblive.tv. We do TechSnap Live at 1 p.m. on Thursdays, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Boom. And also jblive.info for the audio. If you're in the car or sitting at a desk or somewhere where you don't have enough bandwidth for video, jblive.info will get you taken care of. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>